BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Tillis Powell, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to test their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Anne Scott James. What's the meaning of hapless? Hap and L E W S. Hapless. Well, it means without hap. Yes, and hap means what? Oh, chance or fortune. Unlucky. That's all right. Good. Two marks you get. Frank Muir, what is a cratch? C R A T C H. It's, um. It's a word used in ballet. It's what happens. It's what happens when due to a polished floor or something. <laughs> A male ballet dancer does the splits with too much rapidity. <laughs> Cratch. What do you have in your church at Christmas, Frank? What do I have in my church at, at Christmas? Christmas? Parishioners. <laughs> oh. a jolly luck. Ollie. It's a crash. It's a crash. You're it's getting a Crash was originally a manger, and the crash is a rack for feeding beasts out of doors. You see them standing in the field. Sometimes. Dennis Powell, what is an... Umbo, U M B O. Umbo. It's a thing that one would, normally speaking, stick up one's jumbo. <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thought that came to my head, do you understand? Nice to do with umbo pie. No, it's the same root as umbilicus. It may or may not help you. Well, uh, I mustn't say it's a navel. No, it's not quite naval, but it's, it's, near, it's near getting very navel. near. It's somewhere very near the navel. <laughs> no, let's, not go any, let's not go any farther. It's below the belt. It's below the... No, it's above the belt. It's a belt. In most, no, uh, half a mark. <laughs> Umbo is the boss of a shield, usually a thing that is convex on one side and concave on the other, according to which way round you're holding your shield. And it can be any kind of boss or knob in botany or zoology, but it's the same root as the word navel. When you like say he, he's one of the bosses, he's one of the knobs. <laughs> you yes. say he's one of the umbos. <laughs> That's rough here. Uh, Dennis Norton, what is Pashtu? P U S H T O, or if you're very familiar, you can see T at the end, T U rather than T O. Pashtu. Yes. It gets all the easy ones. <laughs> <laughs> P U S H T U. Or T O. Well, it's the only anagram of shut up in the English language. <laughs> That's what uh, Pashtu is. And it's a word that they made up in order to have an anagram. Shut up. Uh, try another language. Crossword lang puzzle. Try no. another language, Dennis. Ça, c'est un anagram de le... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's Indian. It's Indian. Yes. 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 One of them, their Indian dialects. It's an Indian dialect. Uh, one out of two. It's the language of Afghanistan, and it comes from a Persian word, Pashto. All right, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I hope the two women members of the teams will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the program, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is, it is better to be envied than pitied. And Dillis Powell and Frank, yours is, maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of blue questions. Uh, two marks, correct answers. And Scott James, who are known as the blues? Um, oh... A regiment mm -hmm. of a very chic description, smart. Yes. Not really in my social bracket. <laughs> the guards, which guards? I don't know. Oh, yes, <laughs> come on. <laughs> you were in the. Well, it was the things forces. that came up the river from New Orleans when it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the Blue. guards' regiments. Yes, it is. But yeah. um, on foot or on horse? Oh, definitely on horse. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Blues are the regiment of Royal Horse Guards, who were originally the Royal Regiment of Horse. And it's the colour of their uniform, which is blue, and that's why they're called the blues. 
fact, there are what is or was known as a blue gown. Blue gown? Mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked me that. <laughs> it's 18th century. Yes. Much used in the 18th century. And uh, blue stocking, of course, is the other end of the spectrum. Yes. Because <clears throat> the blue stockings were, were a group of young intellectual women of high moral tone. On the other end of the scale, the women of low moral tone. <laughs> and they wore blue gowns because they were confined to a place called Bridewell, mm -hmm. which was a prison for women built on the site of an old palace at the entrance of the Fleet River with the Thames. And women were confined to the Bridewell and there were whipped mm -hmm. and generally knocked about in the sweet name of justice. And most of them were prostitutes. So in the 18th century, a blue gown was a prostitute. Any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> Splendid, Frank. <laughs> two and a half out of two for writing an entirely new chapter in Whitaker's Almanac. Thank you very much. He's not such a fool as he looks, you know. <laughs> not such a fool as he really is. <laughs> Tell us, Powell, who were the blue and the grey? The blue and the grey. The blue and the grey are the two parties in the, the American War of Independence. Well done. No, 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 not War of Independence. No, no. Oh, sorry, the, the, the Civil War. Civil War. Mm. Civil War. And why? Well, they one wore blue and the other wore grey. Quite right. Two marks it is. The blue and the grey were familiar names given oh, to the armies of the North and the South during the American Civil War. The North wore blue uniforms and the South, the Confederates, wore grey. Two marks. Dennis Norton, what are blue books? They are... Actually, they're very useful if you ever have to do research. Um, they're sort of, they're kind of uh, parliamentary reports. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, I, d I don't really know whether they're still going. But yes. I know in Victorian times, they um, absolute mine of information and most beautifully written. That's all right. Um, they're parliamentary or Privy Council reports and, or uh, similar official publications and they're presented by the Crown to both Houses of Parliament, for instance, the report of a Royal Commission. And they're in folio, and each volume is covered with a blue wrapper. Well, the next round is origins and derivations of words and expressions and phrases, and three marks this time, if members of the team can first of all give me the present meaning, and then give us the origin and derivation. Anne Scott James, Bob and Bobby. Well, a bob means a shilling, mm -hmm. and a bobby means a policeman. All right, that's half the answer. Bobby comes from Robert Peel, who um, founded the police force. Yes. And it's a corruption of the, his Christian name. Yes. Now, bob for a shilling. Try the first prime minister. Robert Walpole. Two out of three. Oh. I helped a lot. Um, bob is as... Um, and says a slang term for a shilling. It's said, I'm not quite certain about this, to be named after Sir Robert Walpole, who was at one time Chancellor of the Exchequer and first Commissioner of the Treasury and later Prime Minister. Bobby, as synonym for a policeman, came from Sir Robert Peel, who introduced the modern police system, and in Victorian times, they were called not only Bobbies, but Peelers. Frank, though, to let the cat out of the bag it means to have a bag with a cat inside and open the mouth of same. It means to, uh, to make an injudicious um, remark which reveals a secret that you would have wished to have concealed. Yes. <laughs> That's quite right. And in origin, going back to your cat. To your room, Miss Elizabeth. <laughs> well, there was this... I don't know, what is it? Is it a pig in a poke, which yes. is actually a cat? That's right. When you buy a pig in a poke, you see, you buy a, um, a, a shifting thing uh, writhing inside a bundle, which you're told is a pig, you see. But in fact, it might well be a cat. And, and the miscreant, <laughs> whose machinations he hopes you have not observed, <laughs> has substituted the pig for a cat, which is a less expensive animal. <laughs> but should, should she inadvertently let slip the tie strings of the bag and the cat emerged in front of the prospective buyer, then indeed would he have let the cat out of the residue. <laughs> well done, Frank. <laughs> Three marks it is. Um, absolutely right. <clears throat> this power, the Poet Laureate. The Poet Laureate is um, a poet appointed 
to write poems on various state occasions. Yes. And laureate? Laureate means, should mean that he's crowned with laurels. And there is some Which, reason for that. I suppose, goes back to the classical times mm -hmm. when the athletes and poets were crowned with laurels. Absolutely right. Well done. Three marks it is. Uh, the poet laureate today is, I suppose, a kind of court official appointed, I think, by the Crown on the nomination of the Prime Minister, and he becomes an officer of the Royal Household, and it used to be his job to write odes and poems on, oh, important state occasions. I think he's let off that quite a lot nowadays. Three marks. Dennis Norton, in his pride. Well, it, it means, it means at, the, at the peak of his powers, at the, yes. or the peak of his fame. Yes, in his pride. That's all right. And how does it come to mean that? I can, I can give you a quotation. <laughs> well, they always talk about Chatterton. Yes. They always call him the marvellous boy that perished in his pride. That's it, yes. But where, and if he'd where had it a, came from, I don't know. If he'd had a tail and spread it. Does it, does it come from the oh, is it a pride, pride of, a of peacock? lions? Or no, peacock. a peacock, I yeah. see. Mm. Then this is the first part of his answer, absolutely dead right, something at its peak of perfection, but it does really come in, it's a heraldic term, a peacock in his pride in, on a coat of arms uh, was when he was standing there with his tail displayed in all its glory and his wings drooping, and it um, goes back to heraldry. Two marks. Well, now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the programme. For two marks and Scott James, can you give me the origin of the quotation... It is better to be envied than pitied. Well, I think it is a saw adage or proverb. Anon. Mm, I think you're dead right. You get your two marks. I think it comes right back from the Greek. It's quoted later by Erasmus and by the ubiquitous John Haywood in the uh, 16th century. <laughs> now, Dillis Powell, the origin of your quotation, which was, maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. It's a popular song. Mm hmm By? Uh, not very uh, antique, no. I don't think. And I believe it's Hubert Gregg. Well done. Get your two marks. Hubert Gregg, 20th century <laughs> writer and composer who wrote both the words and the music. And now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanation of how these quotations came into being. And on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation gets the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back, first of all, to Dennis Norton. It is better to be envied than pitied. For some little time now, I've been trying to formulate a definition of middle age. What is it exactly? I, I've sort of come up with some general symptoms, as it were. For example, that middle age is when you're constantly being faced with two related problems. One is trying to remember where you put your glasses and the other is having found them, trying to remember what it was you wanted to look at. <laughs> um, but these are kind of more mental attitudes and they don't really define middle age because I find that it's it's more of a physical problem and with requiring a physical definition like middle age is more waste, less speed. Or <laughs> <coughs> and that's possibly why I was particularly fascinated when I, I went to a cinema and I saw an advertisement which said, do you now buckle where you used to swash. <laughs> if so, join our health club. And I joined <laughs> the local health club, which turned out to be a converted slaughterhouse, <laughs> which was run by a man I took against immediately, an enormous, young, sort of Greek, God. And the first thing he did was he sold me a pair of gym shorts and a singlet for the price that I would normally pay for a winter overcoat. <laughs> and when I 
came out again wearing these things and stood there, he made such a performance of looking at me and saying, oh dear, oh Lord. <laughs> and he walked round me as one would Hadrian's villa <laughs> or the Parthenon or some other scene of ruined grandeur. <laughs> And he said, well, he said, not to worry. He said, we'll get you fit again. He said, give me a few months. He said, you'll be the spryest 60 year old in town. <laughs> I said, I'm 46, but it was too late. He'd already put me among this collection he had there of real old crocs, some of whom were like 48, <laughs> 50, you know. And he gave us sort of homework to do. <laughs> I had to do this thing in the office, in the privacy of the office. I had to bend over and grasp my feet and hold on to them for 10 minutes, <laughs> pulling. And do you know what that did for me? Absolutely nothing, <laughs> except that in two weeks, I went from a size 10 to size 12 shoe. At <laughs> well, any rate, for about four months, I went three times a week to this place, which I came to call privately Hernia's Hideaway. <laughs> <clears throat> and joined in with the other old ruins of lift that barge, tow that bale sort of stuff. Uh, the crunch came and he said to me, we'll have you, I think now, on weight lifting. And he led me in front of this great bar with two enormous iron discs either end. And he said, all right, he said, take it slowly. So I, I spat on my hands like, <laughs> like I saw the Russians do in the Olympics, you know. And I bent over and I clenched my back teeth and I grasped it and I tautened my stomach muscles and I pulled very steadily and slowly for eight and a half minutes. <laughs> At the end of which he said, all right, that'll do for first time. He said, next week, we'll see if we can get it above your ankles. <laughs> he said, all right, now go off and have a shower. I said, can I ask you something? He said, yeah. I said, do you have a shower that projects vertically upwards from the floor like a drinking fountain? So he said, no, why? I said, because I can't straighten up. <laughs> And no more could I. For about three months afterwards, I walked, bent... I don't know if you've ever seen those Groucho marks. <laughs> and that finished it for me. The only thing it did serve was it served as a definition for me of one state of being middle-aged, which is, as the Greeks used to say, it is better to be unfit than PT'd. <laughs> feel exactly the same when the Russians lift those horrible weights. And we go on to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. I said this this very morning. About two weeks ago, my family were away uh, on holiday, and uh, I had the house to myself, and I got home, and I'm not at all a hypochondriac. Not at all. But every time I go home, naturally, I take my temperature. <laughs> I selected one of the 16 thermometers in the bathroom. I thought I was feeling a bit groggy. You know what my temperature was? 98.4 and a half. <laughs> now, when you've got a fever, <laughs> normally, you know, you, you can't think straight. But I thought very clearly. I thought, now, the, the family can't here to help me. I've got to think for myself. 
So I went straight to the bookcase and looked up uh, Mother Shrimpton's uh, recipe for uh, cooling the blood. And it's nettle beer. It's quite a simple recipe. It started off with boil, fo boil four gallons of water. Then it said add uh, two pounds of sugar. Fair enough, in with the sugar. Then eight gallons of uh, nettles had to be collected. So I got out the milk bottles from the fridge, got out a gumboot, <laughs> and found, and it's terribly interesting, that a size 10 gumboot contains exactly, give or take a fluid ounce, half a gallon of milk. <laughs> so I poured the milk down the sink, went out into the garden, and from among the roses and under the hedges, I, we got stacks of nettles in that place. I filled 16, gum, one gumboot, actually 16 times, full of nettles. Into the containers I stuffed the nettles, gardening gloves, no fool. <laughs> yeast, that was easy. My wife's got a tin of dried yeast, which is like sort of rancid mouse droppings. And I put the yeast in, boiled it up, let it cool. It then said filter into bottles filter through gauze. <coughs> Bit tricky, inspiration, up to my wife's dressing table, very thin brazier. Now the great, <coughs> the great advantage which I, I give to you for making this sort of thing with a brazier when filtering is you can get sort of two streams going. <laughs> the Filtered it, 16 quart bottles, bang the cork in, heel of shoe, laid out in the kitchen, went to bed. In the morning, came down, there were the 16 bottles, no corks. <laughs> Looked up, 16 holes in the ceiling. <laughs> and the floor of the kitchen awash with a sort of pale grey fluid with flecks of sort of dried foam floating. No trouble, dashed out, got dustpan, dipped dustpan in fluid, work with brush, and you can fill it. Got a gumboot and a half of nettle beer. <laughs> Swallowed half a pint of the nettle beer, rather an interesting taste. I don't know if you've ever had a vase of flowers which has gone dead. And you've thrown the flowers away and then accidentally taken a sip. Well, that's what nettle, my nettle beer tasted like. Took temperature hour after taking beer up to 104. <laughs> Mother Shrimpton has never let me down. I just could not believe it. And for the last fortnight, I've been at a temperature of 104. I was so hot-blooded that Dillis was quite worried last week. <laughs> recording. And this morning, I, staggering around, steaming slightly like a Christmas pudding, I happened to pick up Mother Shrimpton's uh, natural recipes for all ills, where I dropped it, and the page had turned, and I thought it had got an addition to the recipe. It said, please note... If you live in a flat in London, you will have no trouble because nettles should be gathered from the fields. But if you live in the country, do not take nettles from the garden because nettles that grow near roses and under hedges have far too much nitrogen in them. The result is that your nettle beer will taste like a vase full of flower water. <laughs> and instead of the cooling the blood, it will heat it. So, I realised this morning the reason why my natural recipe had been inverted and with a great feeling of relief, um, it was just because I don't live in town, I live in the country. In other words, my beer heats because I'm a landowner. <laughs> The contest of the two stories is won by Dennis Norden, but nevertheless, the entire contest is won by one and a half marks by Dennis Powell and Frank Muir, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norden introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.
BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Tillis Powell, Dennis Norton, Anne Scott James, and Frank Muir. Round one tries to test their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. We begin with Dillis Powell. Dillis, what is a UNOR? U-N-A-U. UNOR. It's an electrical term. No, no. It isn't. Much, isn't more, it? No. much more animal than that. Much more animal. Unicorn. Oh. Un unicorn with no. two cones. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's the wrong end, Frank, but it's getting very near. <laughs> oh. It's a... It's a two-tailed two unicorn. Uh, well, half a mark for getting that, a bit of that, and, and a very brilliant idea. I'd like to see a two-tailed unicorn. It's a Brazilian two-toed sloth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dennis Norton. What is a fizz? P-H-I-Z. Fizz. Oh, well, I can tell you that one. A fizz is a fizzog. Yes. Or countenance, or physiognomy, <laughs> yes. or mush. <laughs> <laughs> it's well, also a cartoonist. It's also a, a, an artist who illustrated some of Dickens's. That's absolutely cartoon. right. I wish I'd give you a bonus mark, but you get your two. Face or the expression on a face, and it is a, an abbreviation of physiognomy. And Scott James, what is heptarchy or aheptarchy? Well, it means the rule of seven people. That's all right. That'll do. Two marks. It can be, and sometimes is, government by seven rulers. That is a loose association of little kingdoms. But it was applied at the time uh, when the Angles and the Saxons were in Britain, and they split up the whole of England into seven kingdoms. Frank Muir, what is or are vives? V-I-V-E-S. Is it like rabies? Is it some kind of disease? Yes, definitely. But you want four legs rather than two. <laughs> oh, well, it's a disease affecting cattle. <laughs> <laughs> or two birds. Vives. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, so I think one foot and mouth. <laughs> foot and mouth, we think. This is one of the few animals which is not affected by foot and mouth. Mice. Mice. Try mice. Horse. 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 Yes. Horses. It's Horses. a horse disease. All right. One and a half out of two. You crept home with a fair amount of help. Uh, vives are the swelling of a horse's submaxillary gland. Can also affect the ears of poor young horses who are out of grass for the first time. One and a half. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write <coughs> down, and I hope the two women members of the teams will go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, Please don't talk about me when I've gone. And Anne Scott, James and Dennis, yours is, Discretion is the better part of valour. And then at the end of the programme, I shall ask Frank and Dennis, give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of odds and ends, and uh, it's all about mothers and fathers. Two marks for correct answers. Lewis Powell, who is the mother of invention, and who said so? Necessity yes. is the mother of invention. Um, mm. Proverbs said so. Mm -hmm. Yes? Proverbs said so. It's in Ray. It's in proverbs of various kinds. It goes back to a Greek author as well. Yes. Oh, well. Comedy, comedy writer. Um, comedy writer. Plautus Aristophanes. <laughs> the only two I can think All of. All right, two marks. <laughs> Aristophanes it does go back to, though it, uh, an old proverb goes back hundreds and hundreds of years. comes in swift. Uh, Gulliver says, I sold my shoes with wood that I cut from a tree. No man could more verify the truth that necessity is the mother of invention. Dennis Norton... Who is the mother of harlots? You mustn't giggle when they're <laughs> literary program. You simply be act very sophisticated about. <laughs> sir, sir, yes. what does harlots mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Ask Matron. I <laughs> <laughs> um, thought she was young. It's... Uh, <laughs> You could say necessity is the mother of no. <laughs> um, Aristophanes. <laughs> you know, it's Babylon. That's absolutely right. I think we pass over that one pretty quickly and go on to Anne Scott James. Who, according to whom, was the father of English criticism? Oh, now. It's Jenny Dryden. Yes. But according to who laid that down, I don't know. Was uh, it a contemporary? No, a chap in the next century. Well, I think they overlap by a year or two, but a um, chap who wrote about poets in the 18th century. Very easy. Very easy? There's only about one... Dr. Johnson? Day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> one and a half again. Um, Sam Johnson called Dryden the father of English criticism. <laughs> Frank Muir, who was known as the father of his country... Fairly prolific. Um, yeah. <laughs> well, that's true too. <laughs> At a Turk. Was, it was George Washington. Yes, absolutely right. That'll do. Two marks it is. George Washington is commonly known as the father of his country, and it was in fact a journalist called Francis Bailey in 1779 who first called him that, and the expression stuck. Next round is the who, what, and where department. Two marks again for correct answers. Dennis Powell, who was the Witch of Endor, E-N-D-O-R, Witch of Endor? <coughs> she was in the Old Testament. Yes. And um, somebody was advised to go and consult her. Yes. S Samuel? Samuel. Samuel comes into the story. It's in the book of Samuel. Yes, in, it's in the first in book the, of Samuel. In yes, the book of Samuel. Out. Yes. Um, she was the woman in First Samuel, chapter 28, with a familiar spirit whom Saul consulted when he was in terrible trouble, being for frightened by the Philistines and forsaken by God, and at the request of Saul, the witch called up Samuel, who just recently died, and asked for his advice about these horrible Philistines, and Samuel prophesied not only the destruction of his army, but the death of Saul himself, so it really was um, pretty tough advice. Dennis Norton, what do you know about the Jenkins's Ear War? Or the War of Jenkins's Ear? I know very little, and what I... That little is confused. Um, it's something to do with the Spaniards... Yes. ...who cut off the ear of somebody called Jenkins... Yes. ...and they sent it to England in a box, <laughs> and the king opened it, and he said, What's this ear? <laughs> I don't believe that's absolutely historically accurate. Not that's the gist. That's and a very good gist many indeed, Many a true word spoken <laughs> in <laughs> One and a half. Uh, well deserved. Um, Robert Jenkins was a master mariner, and he, in fact, went along himself to the House of Commons and showed a committee there his ear and said it had been cut off by a Spanish captain. And the English were so uh, infuriated by that that they started a war against Spain in 1739 which was known as the War of Jenkins's Ear. In fact, it wasn't this wretched Spanish captain, but a pirate who cut off the ear, and the pirate had already been punished by the Spanish governor in Havana, Cuba, where it all happened. But uh, Dennis got a lot of that right, one and a half. Bit of it. <laughs> and Scott James, where would you find the following, and what were they? King Noble, Chanticleer, Bruin, Tybert, and Grimbert. If you would like to translate them into French, that might help you. I was, a... I was just going to say it sounds French. You've taken the words out of my mouth. <laughs> it sounds like a French Gar... pop group. Is it in Gargantua? <laughs> no, it's earlier than, that. earlier than that. Earlier than that? Earlier than that? Yes. Australia, that's going well. Concentrate on Chanticleer. He may help. Chanticleer is what they always call the rooster. Yes. Think of Chanticleer's main enemy. I don't mean man. Renard, I should say. That's right. No, you're getting that. Oh, is it in the... F um... Yes. Oh, La Fontaine. Is it? No, that's, it uh, must be, because it's much earlier. later than... Um, yes, but, but you're on the right tack. We can't we be an Aesop, because that's, much, that's quite wrong. The names are wrong. What's well, the earliest French thing you ever heard of, Dennis? <laughs> Maurice Trevelyan. <laughs> <laughs> I've only heard of the Chanson de Roland and Gargantua and Pantagruel, and that's absolutely all I've ever heard of all that right. far back. And Villon. We think it's in some French fables. Um, uh -huh. All right, one out of two. 
Uh, it's the old fable or bestiary, Reynard the Fox. And that was first written in France very early, about 1200. And uh, then was brought over here, translated and printed by Caxton. It was one of his earliest printed books in 1481. And King Noble is the lion and Chanticleer is the rooster, Bruin is the bear, Tybert the cat, and Grimbert is the badger. Now, Frank Muir, what precisely was the Spanish main? It was, the, it was where the Spanish galleons used to ply along, carrying the Inca loot and the silver. It's uh, perfectly accurate. The doubloon mines. That's right. But this, is, Mills. this is a derivation from what it was originally. I mean, it's perfectly accurate. One point. It's a part of the coast. It's the yeah. Caribbean coast of South America. Well done. Yeah, well done. Two marks you get. Well done. Well it's done. the mainland of America, um, next to the Caribbean, especially the bit from Panama to the mouths of the Orinoco. <laughs> and afterwards, it became used of the route across the sea, where these uh, Spanish register ships were carrying, as um, Frank says, trading and loot and the rest of it. Two marks. Now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. For two marks, Tillis Powell, can you give me the origin of your quotation? Please don't talk about me when I've gone. It must be a song. Yes, it is a song. Um, <laughs> Please don't talk about me when I've gone. <laughs> Edwardian? No, 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 oh, no. Victorian? No, no, no. no? Pop, you know. Uh, Pop? Uh, I think one out of two. Um... Please don't talk about me when I've gone. I think the next line is, please don't talk about me from now on. And it's a modern song, a modern-ish, by Sidney Clare and Sammy Stett. And Sammy Stett was L. Jolson's accompanist. Sorry, I can never get that right. Well, now, Anne Scott James, the origin of your quotation, please. Discretion is the better part of valour. Well, I <clears throat> think it's a proverb. Yes. I think that's quite good enough. Two marks. It comes in a 16th century book of proverbs. Um, it was afterwards used, almost certainly afterwards, by Beaumont and Fletcher, the dramatists, and you'll find it in Henry IV, Part I of Shakespeare. <coughs> the better part of valour is discretion, I think, spoken by Falstaff. Two marks. Well, now I'm going to ask <laughs> Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and on this occasion, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. And so, back to Frank Muir and his quotation, please don't talk about me when I've gone. Well, regular listeners to this programme, if any, uh, <laughs> may, may have noticed that when invention flagged this side of the table, I usually tell a story more or less true about the poodles in my family. <laughs> Over the years since this programme started, we've had four girl poodles, one bred from the other. And we've now only got two, and they've never been mine. They've always been my wife's and the children's. They've bagged one each. And I've never had one. And two months ago, I've got my own dog at last, bitch, actually, and it's an Afghan hound. <laughs> now, the extraordinary thing about an Afghan hound is that there's very little literature about them, and I'm a great reader up of things before keeping them or using them. So um, there's a a sort of funny American one. There's a book published about 1936. So what you're about to hear now is probably the only definitive guide to the care and maintenance of Afghan hounds. <laughs> now, an Afghan hound, first of all, is an achingly beautiful animal. Its um, size, when sort of six months old, which mine is, is about the size of a miniature donkey. <laughs> It looks rather like a giant greyhound in a fun fur. <laughs> <clears throat> when we first got out, she was upside down in my son's arms, drooling heavily from the car. A complacent dog, to start with. She doubled her, her weight to two and a half stone in two months. Now, I'm not a morning man. I don't speak, you know, before I finish coughing about 11 and then I'm prepared to enter into a conversation. <laughs> and normal dogs at breakfast, they just sit there whinnying slightly and looking, you, looking at you, hopefully, that you'll give them a bit. But I was offered physical violence by this thing. <laughs> Afghans wrestle. They don't just sit there hoping for a bit. Afghans are large dogs. They have, they're curious looking. They have... Um, Lots of fur under their tummies. 
and huge feet. They're either wearing boxing gloves, golden boxing gloves, or they're wearing golden pyjama bottoms which are falling down. <laughs> and suddenly this huge foot came beside me, this huge golden foot, and a black nose poked at my egg. And I suddenly realised there's a lot of height in an Afghan. So I pushed it aside, and it came back. This damn great paw came on my shoulder. My wife says I was exaggerating, but that dog put an arm lock on me <laughs> as I was sitting over my breakfast egg. So, with an Afghan, what you have to do is you suddenly have to live rather higher off the ground. <laughs> they are huge dogs. They, um, they eat, Afghans eat bones, biscuits, um, buttons, they eat bedding, they eat beds. <laughs> they eat anything bendable. They eat boots. They eat book jackets. They eat books. They eat bookcases. <laughs> they love gnawing on furniture legs. But if you're, if you're worried about them, it's, it, it, the, the great thing to worry about is that Afghans are rather like... They're hollow inside, you see. They have this rib cage and sort of no innards. <laughs> And they have uh, a cubic capacity of liquid, rather resembling one of those old-fashioned fire extinguishers which are hanging on the wall. And just the same as a fire extinguisher, if you tap an Afghan on the nose <laughs> or roll it over on its back, two and a half gallons of liquid <laughs> emerges. They, they, they can't help this. We've had it two months and my wife is in despair. She thinks we've got the one dog in the world that'll never be house-trained. I mean, last night, she'd been outside and dug up the lawn, and, and she'd sat on the compost heap because it's warm on her bot. <laughs> and she'd rolled in the, mask, in, the, in the clippings, and she came in and she sat by me on the chair, and she'd laid her long black snout on my knee. And I looked at her, and her gold-flecked eyes looked at me, you know, and a beautiful warm feeling came over me or to be more exact, over my left leg. <laughs> and I re realised that Kassa was at it again. <laughs> so that's how to keep an Afghan hound. But just, just a little word of warning. Uh, if you're around Staines, Egham, Thorpe, where I live, uh, don't talk b uh, about the dog, because the um, dogs are terribly sensitive about, about being laughed at. It's all right with the poodles. If you say, you've got a funny poodle, because there are two of them, so they don't know which one you're, you're, you're talking to. So. But please, please don't talk about me one Afghan. <laughs> consolation for Frank's wife, Polly, must be that it wasn't a great Dane. <laughs> now we go back to Dennis Norton, and if you remember, his quotation was, discretion is the better part of valour. If you can possibly rent your mind temporarily from Afghan hounds <laughs> to the darker days of the last World War, World War II, because that was the last time that I heard a line which sounded reasonably like that quotation you've just heard. Um, what I was that time was rather a strange job. I was a lab technician in a small unit which existed to train budding intelligence officers in how to interpret aerial reconnaissance photographs. Trouble was I didn't have any aerial reconnaissance photographs because we were stationed in a remote part of Scotland and we didn't even have a plane. <laughs> So what I used to do is I used to rely on old copies of the National Geographic magazine. I used to take any aerial photographs I found in that and give those to these budding intelligence officers. It was really was helpful as training, but not in a strict immediate military sense <laughs> helpful, because the National Geographic magazine tended to have photographs only of places like Peru <laughs> and Van Diemen's Land. 
and we weren't really at war with them at the time, so um, it, it was rather academic, but they learnt a lot of geography on the way. Now, the incident that I have in mind occurred at possibly the most exciting and stimulating period of my whole wartime career, because what happened was the unit camera club managed to get hold of a live female model. <laughs> and she was persuaded to pose for the camera club in the nude. And she was a rather dim, naffy girl <laughs> called Ella Mahoney. And she wouldn't quite pose in the nude. She insisted on keeping on a grey flannel vest and PT shorts. <laughs> But I can tell you that when you've been stationed in a remote part of northern Scotland for eight months, that is still pretty heady stuff. <laughs> so, on the evening when she, she uh, did her modelling, not only was the whole camera club present clicking away with cameras, but also the adjutant, the officer's mess, the neighbouring company of Pioneer Corps, <laughs> and two German parachutists. <laughs> well, it all meant a lot of work for me because I was the lab technician. I was the only bloke who could develop all the ensuing photographs, you see. And the CO had also laid on, for the following day, one of these aerial reconnaissance photograph interpretation tests. So it was all <clears throat> rather confusing for me because I had to dash backwards and forwards between all these photographs of Ella Mahoney and the... Um, photograph which I'd picked out of the National Geographic magazine, which was of a range of Tibetan mountains. <laughs> and I got the enlarger and enlarged down to one mountain and sent a 10 by 8 round. Now, as I say, there was a lot of activity that night. <laughs> well, it's all very well for you to laugh because you're wise after the event, you see. You, you can see what I didn't, you see. And... It, suddenly the realisation came to me that maybe that wasn't a mountain <laughs> that I'd actually enlarged <laughs> for the intelligent officers to try and interpret. So I went round to the hut where they were looking at this 10 by 8 and I arrived there in time to hear one intelligence officer say, well, it looks to me about 5,000 feet high <laughs> I think there are cart tracks round the lower slopes. <laughs> and another intelligence officer says, I think I can see traces of recent troop movement. <laughs> uh, I decided, I caught the eye of the commanded officer, and I said, Sir, may I talk to you for a moment? And he said, What is it? And I made a clean breast of the whole thing. <laughs> And he said, I see. And he turned round to the intelligence officers and he said, I'm afraid, gentlemen, this test will have to be postponed for a moment as there is some confusion. And picking up one of these 10 by 8 photographs, he made what I thought was rather an apt twist at the, at the time on an old <laughs> quotation because he said, pointing to the 10 by 8, he said, this creation is Tibet or part of Ella. <laughs> By your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories is nevertheless won by Frank Muir, and the entire contest goes to the other team by one mark, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.
The BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Dillis Powell, Dennis Norton, <laughs> Anne Scott James, and Frank Muir. <laughs> Round one tries to test their respective vocabularies. Two marks, they get the meaning of these words right. Dillis Powell, what is brassage? It's the age at which you begin wearing a bra. <laughs> that is about four. <laughs> it's a perfectly splendid idea to this, but this word I think was first used in 186, and I don't think they had them then. So. <laughs> I'm going to give you. Metal. I'm going to give you with brass. Brassage is or was the charge made by the royal mint cover its actual costs when it itself was making money. You see, you can't make money for nothing, and you have to cover the mint's costs, and that's called pressing. Dennis Norton, what is a braziery? B-R-A-Z-I-E-R-Y, braziery. I would have said it's something made, made of uh, brass. Um, that's all right. Where brass is made or something like that. You've got both answers in one. It can be the work of a brazier, which is something worked in brass. It can also be the establishment or smithy or foundry or whatever it is where articles are, in fact, worked in brass. And you get your two marks. Well done. Anne Scott James, what is humus? H-U-M-U-S. Oh, it's soil. It's that goodly stuff, goodly stuff which gardeners like so much. But why? Well, surprisingly, it's made out of everything that rots. Rotting leaves, rotting fish bones, rotting flesh. Absolutely right. <laughs> um, putting it perhaps slightly more technically, it's the soil that results from the slow decomposition of organic matter. And as um, Anne said, it makes a very good foundation for plant growth. Two marks. Frank Muir, what is or was mumbo jumbo? It's, well, a... Uh... Uh, um, a small totem pole yeah, no kidding, uh. was a mumbo, <laughs> and a huge one <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a primitive object of worship. That's it, absolutely right. Large. <laughs> well, I wouldn't be certain about that, but in anyway, two marks. Well, before we begin round two, what I do is to give each team a quotation for them to write it down. And the two women members of the teams will, I hope, go on studying those quotations because at the end of the program, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, your quotation is, Now cracks a noble heart. And Anne Scott James and Dennis, yours is, Prevention is better than cure. And then at the end of the program, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. So to round two, which is a round of odds and ends, two marks for correct answers. Lewis Powell, maybe a boot is a boot is a boot, but what do to boot and bootless mean and why? To boot and bootless. To boot? Yep. To boot means extra as well as. Mm hmm And bootless means um, in vain. Yes. Do you know why they come to mean that? It's an archaic word, um, a meaning it doesn't uh, to help or not to help. That's it. Yes, that's good enough. Come on. <laughs> um, <coughs> well done. <laughs> Nothing to do with footwear, this. To boot means as well or into the bargain or to the good. And similarly, bootless means unavailing. Well, it comes from an old English word, boat, which means advantage or profit or good in that sense. Dennis Norton, what sort of books did R. M. Ballantyne write, and can you name one of them? Yeah, smashing books. He wrote. <laughs> when I was a kid, they were the first, the first books I really enjoyed. They, they were adventure stories, mm -hmm. um, 
The gorilla hunters, the yeah. young fur traders. That's right. Um, and there was somebody called Peterkin, <laughs> in, as I remember. <laughs> Young fair traders is perfectly right. The gorilla hunters, I'm not at all certain about. I mean, uh, uh, if so... If yes, the gorilla hunt. Ungava was another one. Oh, jolly good. Mm. Um, <laughs> I thought, because this is the only one I, in fact, I've read myself, the, the best known one I thought was Coraline. The Coraline. The Coraline, yes. Yeah. And the dog Crusoe and Erling the Bell. But well done, two marks. He lived at the, throughout most of the 19th century and wrote adventure books for boys. Hans Scott James, what was a Tom Abedlam? Tom Abedlam. I should think it was something to do with madness, wasn't it? Yes, and it sounds like Shakespearean. It comes from Shakespeare. It comes in Shakespeare. Yeah. Well, somebody crazed, I would have thought. Yes, that's part of the answer. It isn't the whole thing, Anne. I mean, it's but the son you... of that chap who read his eyes put out. Oh, yes, fair enough. Edgar, yes. Yeah. In Lear, yeah. The... He, uh, he was he... kind of beggar. He was that's it. Sort of that's that's what I wanted. Oh, yes. Man. Yes, the two ideas are, first of all, begging, and second, real or pretended madness. I think you just get your marks. Um, he was somebody who um, pretended to be mad and begged around the country. And really, they started after the monasteries were dissolved, because the monasteries used to give assistance and help to the poor. And after that, there were far too many of these beggars wandering around, and many of them pretended to be more mad than they were, because the official lunatic asylum of Bedlam became very much overcrowded. And this, again, in turn, became a splendid way of um, making money by fraud, by pretending to be mad. These were... Tom Abedlam men, also called Abraham men. Frank Muir, in what sort of an establishment would you expect to find Nell Trent? <laughs> Nell Trent. Dickens, try Dickens. Uh, was she large? No. No, no. just the opposite. No. Oh, was, uh, <laughs> small Nell. Yes. In the, uh, little Nell. Little Nell of the... <laughs> Of the old curiosity shop, Jack. You're absolutely right. <laughs> well done. The establishment in which you would have found Nell Trent was Dickens's old curiosity shop because she was there as the sister of Fred Trent. Well, now we have a round of sentences which contain <coughs> deliberately some difficult or unusual words and three marks if members of the team can give me a rough or fairly clear idea of what these sentences might mean. Dillis Powell... Speaking as a student of ethology, I'd say you were a jobbernole. Ethology? Mm -hmm. The study of morals. Yes, it can be there. Mm. Study of morals. No, jobbernole. Um, jobbernole. Um, that's a, um, a, it just means it's an abusive term, that's why I know. Yes, it is, but uh, I don't think I can give you more than one and a half um, out of the total of possible three. Ethology meant the science of character, particularly the formation of character, but it's now been taken over by the biologists, and it n normally is applied to um, animal behavior, the science of animal behavior, naked ape and all that. Job and no means a stupid person, a, a muddlehead who can't get ideas right. Dennis Norton, a hungry donkey will ruin a pallias, or if you prefer it, payas, just as a smelly one would spoil your... Pallium, P-A-L-L-I-U-M. So, Pallias and Pallium. Well, Pallias is, is one is the uh, sort of mattress stuffed with straw. Yes. And a smelly, what is it? A, sm a smelly one would, would ruin or spoil your Pallium. Well, I should think a smelly donkey would spoil Pallium. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cloak, isn't it? Yes. Oh, is it? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Go on. All right, three well, more. Well, that'll do. That'll do. That'll do. Cloak. Three marks. Spoiling cloak. Yes. <laughs> well done. Anne Scott James, from old Ted, the boatman, if you ask for a bellyful of codling, you're more likely to get a mouthful of Billingsgate. <laughs> Can I have both meaning of both those unusual words? What well, boatman you want the meaning no, of? No, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little cod. That's it's right. a little fishy-wishy. That's right. And Billingsgate is what? You'll be likely to get a mouthful of Billingsgate from him. Comes from the Billingsgate fishwives who used to use for foul language. Yeah. Uh, codling, a small codfish, and Billingsgate is violent abuse, which probably quite wrongly was attributed to the fishwives in the market of Billingsgate. Frank Muir, the young Indian maiden looked up at the soldier appealingly. Your Ruti, R O O T Y, your Ruti will be safe with me, she said. <laughs> I can. <laughs> 
I can hide it in my tum-tum. Both words of Indian? Yes. Ah, right. Rooty, some, some form of food? Yes. A root vegetable? <laughs> no. I'll help you a bit. Think of pan roti. Think of what? Pan roti. Mm, what, a, a, a roast? No, no, don't, don't roast it. It's, uh, Just bread. Bread. Yeah, bread. 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 Yes, that's right. I will hide your piece of toast. Or bread. <laughs> or bread. <laughs> Half a loaf is better. Um, then uh, in my tum-tum. Yes, and the tum-tum is what? It's, uh, it's a kind of uh, Indian shopping bag made of beads. <laughs> it's written all over your face, Jack, but it's not a shopping bag. If you... <laughs> Frank, add a couple of wheels to it and you'll be almost exactly right. It's a, it's a card, in my yes, card. Yes, that's right. Yeah. You find them in the super bazaar. <laughs> uh, Ruti was Anglo-Indian military slang, simply for bread. It comes from a Hindi word, roti, which just means bread. And tum-tum, curious enough, <coughs> again, in India, meant a light vehicle or dog cart. It also meant various other things, which is why Frank did splendidly and not getting terribly misled. And now we come to the last round and go back to those quotations I gave the two teams earlier in the program. The two marks to this power. Can you give me the origin of the quotation, Now cracks a noble heart? Uh, Shakespeare. Yes. Hamlet. Yes. Death of. Yes. Spoken by, do you remember? Horatio. Yes, Horatio. Right. Absolutely right. Well, now, Anne Scott James, your quotation, please, origin. Prevention is better than cure. I think it's a proverb, Jack. Mm, you're absolutely right. You'll get your two marks. It uh, certainly is found in the 13th, 13th century in Latin. It's quoted later on in the 17th century by Thomas Fuller, in the 19th century by Thomas La Peacock, and uh, I don't know where it first came from. Anyway, two marks. Well, now I'm going to ask um, Frank and Dennis to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So back to Frank and to his quotation. Now cracks a noble heart. Good evening. Um, a short essay on jokes, stories, wheezes, wise cracks, mirth provoking, titter making, laughs by F. Herbert Muir, manufacturer of wit substitute. <laughs> you can tell when a joke has been made, and you can tell what sort of joke has been made by observing closely the kind of laughter inculcated by a certain remark. For instance, if you hear a laugh like this, <laughs> it means that the man has not heard that particular joke. <laughs> but if you hear this sort of laugh, <laughs> It means he has heard the joke before, but it's his boss telling the joke. <laughs> now, jokes have always been rather looked down upon by well-born people until the Victorian times, when the sense of humour suddenly became fashionable. And now, jokes are very much recognised. Now, the jokes generally, and titters, provoking remarks, and witticisms and wisecracks can be divided into two sorts. Long jokes and short jokes. Long jokes tend to divide into various sorts. There's the genre joke, the joke about the sort of trade the person is concerned with. A sort of typical genre joke was, it appears this man was lying in a private ward at a hospital and the nurse knocked on the door came in, said to the man, I am to prepare you for the operation. And she took his pyjama jacket and his pyjama trousers off and she rubbed surgical spirit all over the man and she powdered him all over and she said to the man, before I take you down to the surgery, is there anything you'd like to know? And the man said, yes, why did you knock? <laughs> For example, of a genre joke. <laughs> then you have jokes about unfortunate people. For instance, prisoner jokes. 
typical prisoner joke is, it appears that there is this prisoner lying in the dungeon, shackled, rats fighting each other as to who should bite his toes. <laughs> One green crust of bread to last him a fortnight. And it appears there was a scratching on the wall and a stone was removed just by his right shoulder. And the voice said, here, what's it like in your cell? And he said, absolutely awful. There's rats and, and by some chains and I'm, I'm manacled and duff. Got one bit of green bread to last me a fortnight. And the voice said, what's well, funny? It's lovely in here. I've got wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. I've got a colour tilly. And girls come in every evening and sing to me and read me from books. What's your food like? And she just this green crust to last me a fortnight. And the voice said, cool. You know what I've just had? Minestrone soup. And then roast grouse with port wine gravy. <laughs> he said, yeah, I'll tell you what. He said, pass me through your green crust and I'll dip it in my gravy. <laughs> the man said, would you? Would you? And he passed his green crust through the hole and there was a slight pause and the stone was replaced. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, Mr Norden and I, for 21 years, have been concocting, not those stories, but similar sorts of stories. <laughs> when I first started, people who wrote jokes were looked upon the lowest of the low, but only last, only last week I saw an article in which one really very intelligent critic said that the art of making people laugh is one of the most noble occupations a man can have in these troubled times. So do see what a change has happened. Twenty years ago, when Dennis and I started, jokes and wisecracks were ignoble rubbish. But now, but now, as Shakespeare said, now cracks are noble art. <laughs> <laughs> We go on to Dennis Norden, and if you remember, his quotation was, prevention is better than cure. In rising to answer on behalf of the guests, <laughs> <laughs> people often say, it must be very useful, all those words that you learn on, on my word, words, you know, muliebrity, <laughs> brassage, they must come in awfully handy. <laughs> which I reply never. <laughs> I know that the only thing that has ever helped me on my word is this attention we have to pay to the exact meaning of words and sometimes warping them slightly. <laughs> and that came in very, very useful to me at a very fraught time of my life. In fact, to put it at its bluntest, it helped me work my ticket from the army. <laughs> now, when I went in the army, all I had to fight them with was this my word experience. And I hadn't been in the army three hours when I realised this was no kind of life for a slip of a lad like me. <laughs> I didn't know how to get out of it and I thought I'd try to aggravate them so much that they would chuck me out of it. And as I say, all I could call on was my my word experience. So on the third day of our initial training, the sergeant major commanded us to stand at ease. Whereupon I left the parade ground <laughs> and went absent without leave for four months. <laughs> they finally picked me up, brought me back to the CO and said, now what, he said, what is the meaning of this, Norton? I said, I did what I was ordered to do, sir. Ordered? Yes, sir, by the sergeant major, sir. Sergeant major, did you command this? No, sir. I said, if you would ask the sergeant major to repeat his last command. Sergeant major said, what I said to the men was, he said, I said, squad, squad, stand at, hates. <laughs> I said, well, that's where I've been. <laughs> Four months standing at Hayes. <laughs> For the benefit. The benefit of uh, overseas listeners, Hayes is a small town in the county of Middlesex and a very pleasant place to stand 
<laughs> during the summer months. Now, the one thing about the army is they're very literal. If you can prove that word for word you were correct, they can't do a thing about it. So I was let off and I knew that I was then on the right tack. And I, I played on this weakness. For example, a little bit later, when we were ordered to quick march, I left the parade ground <laughs> and I went and locked myself in a cupboard. Again, after four days, I was recovered from there, I brought in front of the CO, and I again said I did what I was told. He said to Sergeant what did you tell him? Sergeant me said, I said, quick, hutch! <laughs> now, I was able to point out <clears throat> that in the Oxford English Dictionary, the word hutch is a verb meaning to put or lay in a chest. <laughs> Having no chest handy, I put or lay myself in a cupboard. <laughs> Well, now, the CO goggled a bit at this, and when I went on to point out that in any case, the command was in itself ungrammatical because the word quick was an adjective, and it really should be rephrased as quickly. <laughs> then he began to get little bits of saliva at the corner of his mouth. <laughs> well, I'll skim over the, some of the episodes. For example, our passing out parade in front of Field Marshal Montgomery. <laughs> on the command to stand to attention. I left the parade ground <laughs> and I was gone for eight months. Now, when, <laughs> when I came back, the CO and the adjutant were waiting for me. And I noticed the adjutant had in one hand an Oxford English dictionary <laughs> and in the other he had a copy of QRs, Queen's Regulations. He said to me, all right, what, what did he say this time? I said, the sergeant major said, parade, parade, shun. Now, the word shun, <laughs> if you will look it up, means to avoid, eschew, <laughs> or hide by concealment. <laughs> Adjutant said, just a minute, Norton. And opening his dictionary, he said, the verb shun is transitive. In uh -huh. other words, it must have an object. <laughs> the CO said, well done, Jim. <laughs> I think we've got him. Do you think we've got grounds for a court-martial? The adjutant said, with any luck, we've got grounds for a firing squad. <laughs> the CO said, very well, we'll send up the relevant papers and a copy of the particular QR to the divisional educational officer, and we'll see what happens. I said, if you do that, sir... May I have permission to send up a brief on the meaning of the word shun? He was so cocky, he said, by all means. <laughs> now, it was really a shame to take the money, you see, because <laughs> he had a copy of the smaller Oxford English <laughs> I had the large two-volume one, you see, in which it says, and you can look this up, it says, shun intransitive to move away from or escape. So I knew I was all right, that I'd get the discharge. And in fact, the reply, and this was also another bit of luck, from the Divisional Educational Officer, Brigadier J. Longland, <laughs> in its brief way, only justified the fact that my submission had been better than theirs, because all it said was, brief on shun is better than QR. <laughs> By your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories has this evening been won by Dennis Norden, and his team, and Scott James and Dennis Norden, win the entire contest by one half of one mark. <laughs> In my word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason 
and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words, and those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Dillis Powell, and Dennis Norton. Here's round one to try and test their respective vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words right. Hans Scott James, what is a snaffle? S-N-A-F-F-L-E, snaffle. Oh, it's a kind of bit. Mm -hmm. a, a bit of the sort of harness of a horse. <laughs> Where do you put it, Anne? Well, in its mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and does it like it? I mean, I, I want a slightly more accurate description more of a snaffle. When you have, to, um, if you have four reins, yes. they all get mixed up. Mm -hmm. And the snaffle is the one which doesn't do the hardest work. It's a sort of rather weak mm. kind of bit. Yes, that'll do. Two marks, well done, here. It's a bridle uh, without a curb, a quite sort of slender, plain, jointed bit. And you normally have it not with a double, but a single rein. So that to ride a horse on the snaffle means to manage your horse gently rather than uh, crudely or abruptly. Um... Thank you. What is tonight? T O N I T E. Tonight or tonight? Tonight, I think. It's what um, flashes in neon lighting on Broadway to indicate there's a show on that evening. <laughs> <laughs> I absolutely did right. <laughs> tonight. Yes. Is it like. Uh, uh, dynamite and gelatinite. Yes. yes, very much like that. Well, then, fine. Then uh, gelignite is explosive jelly. <laughs> <laughs> and toe, no, it can't be. <laughs> it's a sort of um, uh, the reverse of uh, a rapidly ingrowing toenail. <laughs> yes, yes, it would look very like that on a rather large scale. It's an explosive. I'll give you your two marks. It is, in fact, a powerful gun cotton explosive, mainly used for blasting. It comes from a Latin word meaning to thunder. <coughs> Dennis Powell, what is a la? L A R. It's, um, it's a deity. What kind? Singular. Of the house. Yes. <laughs> Would you like to sort it's of a explain house a bit deity. more? The lares and penates. Yes. Where the domestic. <coughs> Protect, protecting deities. For which nation? The, the Romans. <laughs> You've got everything absolutely right. Two marks it is. All right, Dennis Norton. <coughs> Dennis, what is a bum boat? A bum boat is a boat that is hard astern. <laughs> It's what, it's, what, it's what people row out to ships in to sell sort of vegetables mm. and, and carved wooden things. Mm. Mm. Absolutely to visiting right. ships. <laughs> well done, Dennis. Two marks. Now, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down, and I want the two women members of the teams to go on studying those quotations, because at the end of the programme, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, your quotation is... To each his sufferings. And Dillis Powell and Frank Muir, yours is Count Your Blessings One by One. And at the end of the program. 
And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their idea of how these came to be said or written. <coughs> Round two is about places far and near. Two marks if you can tell me what books, by what authors, you associate with the following. <coughs> Anne Scott James, Barsetshire. Oh, the novels of Anthony Trollope. Which one? Um, well, Barchester Towers, to start yes. with, and a great many others. <laughs> well, that is strictly accurate. I was trying to get a sort of long list from you. Oh, The Warden. The Warden. Yes, oh, uh, Framley Parsonage. Yes. Uh, come on, quick, quick. No, no, You're doing very well. Yeah. You're doing very well. An encouraging. <laughs> oh, the last, uh, the last Chronicles of Barchester, which right. is the sort of summing up of the whole thing. Jolly Enough. good. Yes, very good indeed. Frank Muir, Brobding Nag. It's very hard to pronounce. B-R-O-B-D-I-N-G-N-A-G. Brobding Nag. What was the question? Uh, I'd like to know what books by what author you associate with that very curious word. Book two. <laughs> yes. <laughs> You're dead right. <laughs> Book two of uh, Gulliver's Travels. That's yeah. the shortened version of the long title, which escapes my memory, by Jonathan Swift. Well done. <laughs> and the sort of chaps who lived there, what did they look like? Uh, biggish, on the whole. <laughs> <laughs> Much bigger than, uh, than our hero. Yes, absolutely right. Well done, Frank. Dennis Powell, Eatonswill. E A T A N S W I W L. Eatonswill. Uh, Dickens. Yes. Um, Pickwick Papers. Yes, and what was it? Um, it was a, an area. Yes. An area, a, a political area, <laughs> an electioneering area. Well done. <laughs> yes, you've said quite enough, that's fine. Two oh. marks. Uh, Eatonswell in Dickens' Pickwick Papers was a place visited by Pickwick during the course of an election, and there were two terrific candidates. One was called Fitzkin, and the other was called Slumkey, and Slumkey won in the end. Two marks. Dennis Norton, Transylvania. Ah, oh, Transylvania. Well, there's all sorts of... But I think it was originally Dracula. Yes. By Bram Stoker. But they also have used it in umpteen stories since, which all start with a coach coming in and saying, could you tell us the way to the castle? And I mean, I wouldn't go there half a nightfall if you paid it. <laughs> <laughs> That's absolutely right. Well done, Dennis. Two marks. Transylvania is the country in which the novel Dracula, dr novel about vampires by Bram Stoker was placed, and it was supposed historically to be <coughs> a place that a lot of chaps who were supposed to be vampires came from, it was a province, a mountainous province of Romania, as it was before the 1914-18 war. All right. Next round is a round of sentences which we try to include some rather difficult or unusual words. So please can you give me, for three marks, a rough idea of what the following sentences mean, defining the difficult words as closely as you can. Anne Scott James. I suffer from anosmia, she said scathingly, Otherwise, I would have recognised you for the black, white-striped, bushy-tailed, American carnivorous animal that you are. Well, anosmia means I haven't got a sense of smell. Yes. And therefore, I don't recognise you for a skunk. Absolutely right. Well done. Three marks. <laughs> Splendid. Frank Miller. Pretty little low San accidentally rubbed... Ho Chan's beautiful kakimono against her and got smudges all over her obi. Kakimono, K A K E M O N O, and obi, obi. -I. Oh, a scroll or a painting? Yes. Ah, of course, yes. Rubbed her, her, Ho Chan's it? beautiful kakimono against her and got smudges all over her obi. Is that bow at the back? Yes, that's that the, 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 the back. Here's a at the back in most of the Yes, but what's, the, what's at the bow of the back of? The kimono. Oh, no, it's, it's about the back of a sash. It's not better than that. It's a sash. Kakimono is a Japanese wall picture, which is usually painted on silk and mounted on rollers. And I suppose if it were freshly painted, it could have, uh, the paint could have come off. But obi is that bright, broad sash worn by Japanese women and children. Dillis Powell. I cannot eat this spitchcock. Give it to my spits. S-P-I-T-C-H-C-O-C-K and S-P-I-T-Z. Cannot eat this spitzcock. Give it to my spitz. Spitz is a dog, I think. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. Spitz is a dog, <clears throat> uh, and spitzcock is a, 
a bird which has been hung too long, like a <laughs> kakimono. <laughs> no. Spatchcock. Spatchcock. That's no. different, yes. Oh, it's different, is it? It's, it's very different. what that yes. means either, so it doesn't help. It's about as opposite from a bird as you can get. It's a fish. That's right. Yeah, Spitchcock right. is an eel split and broiled as a dish that you eat, but some don't. And Spitz or Spitz is a small dog with a very pointed muzzle, a Pomeranian, in fact, and it's just the German word, a pointed dog, Spitz. Hm. Two. Dennis Norden, Hans cried the keeper angrily, don't throw your pretzels at the quetzels, P-R-E-T-Z-E-L-S, and Q-U-E-T-Z-A-L-S, don't throw your pretzels at the quetzels. A pretzel is, is the thing that you have in, in bars in America when you have a drink, it, it's, uh, it's like a figure eight yes. sort of baked thing, with, it's very salty and it, it helps you to drink more, that's if you need any help. <laughs> yes. Um, and a quetzal is what they wore in the Royal Hunt of the Sun, the, the Inca yes. chief whose, whose name is... It isn't on the tip of my tongue, it's just about halfway down my gullet, <laughs> so I won't, I won't really hang about waiting for it. Montezuma or Atahualpa? No, Atahualpa. <laughs> um, it was a kind of headdress that yes, she wore. Yes, made from what, um, um, Dennis? you get there if you know what the headdress is made of. With feathers of some yes, kind, right. some kind of... It's pretzel or bretzel, and they're, as Dennis quite rightly said, they're shaped like a knot or figure eight, a crisp kind of biscuit, very salty, and used as a relish with beer, starting in Germany and no doubt in the places uh, like Minnesota, the German parts of the United States as well. The quetzal is the, one of the most beautiful Central American birds with most beautiful and gorgeous tail feathers, Aztec word. Now we come to the last round and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. To Marx and Scott James, can you give me the origin of your quotation, to each his sufferings? Well, the most suffering thing I can think of in the whole of literature is King Lear. Uh, how about a public school? Oh, Eton. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, who wrote about this? Who wrote about Eton? Um, Gray. Yes, this is Thomas Gray's poem, Ode on a Distant Prospect of Eton College, and it runs, to each his sufferings, all are men condemned alike to groan, the tender for another's pain, the unfeeling for his own. Now, dear Lisbeau, can I have the origin of your quotation? Count your blessings one by one. It's a song, I think. Sung by um, Gracie Shields. Hold on. It's a song of which the music was written by Reginald Morgan and the words by Edith Temple. It was published in 1946. Well, now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being. And in this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norden and to his quotation, to each his sufferings. Um, some of you may have noticed that when, when we came into the studio, I gave Frank, handed to him, two small cast-iron rings. This is part of a, a ceremony that happens between us Every six months, the exchange of the two small cast iron rings. And it dates back to the time, um, over three years ago, when we terminated our partnership. Frank to go off to find his fortune as a television executive, and me to stay and lose mine um, as a writer. You see, but like all <laughs> the end of all long relationships, the question came up of dividing up between us all the stuff we had accumulated over 14 years of partnership. Um, and as some, this was quite an easy job in some respects. I mean, things like um, typewriters and, and filing cabinets and ashtrays we could do quite easily on this sort of one for you, one for me, one for you, one for me sort of principle. It got a little bit more trying when it came to paper clips, because he said that straightened out ones only count half. <laughs> <laughs> and paper clips are always difficult to count anyway because they're so promiscuous. <laughs> you know, as you, you put two paper clips in a drawer, one either end of a drawer, shut the drawer, come back to it an hour later, they're linked. <laughs> anyway. But the real crunch, as they say, the problem, 
came on one particular item of furniture, which we had, the last remaining item, which we bought very early in our joint career. In fact, the very first time that a producer had said to us when we presented him a script for a series, look, why don't you have a hand at casting some of the girls? That, so it was a sofa <laughs> in question. It, it is, gives you some idea of our naivety at that time, in that we bought an L-shaped sofa. <laughs> that we never really got the use out of it that we <laughs> intended, because it's very difficult to find L-shaped actresses. <laughs> See, but nevertheless, it had come in useful over the years to sort of have a kip after lunch. The question came of dividing this between us. You see, because it had only four legs, one at each end, like a cow, you know. <laughs> so that if we had done the trick of dividing it in the middle, we'd both have been left with a rather strange-looking item of furniture which just leaned down to the floor. <laughs> So Frank said, I tell you what, he said, I'll take it and you can come and visit it at weekends <laughs> and holidays and special occasions. I said, no, no, I'll take it and you come and visit it. And he said, no, no, I, and anyway, that's where the real sort of Barney started and raised voices and recriminations and tears and, you know, <laughs> I've given you the best years of my life, you know, all that sort of thing. And, <clears throat> we decided the only way to settle the problem was to seek the advice of a third party, so we went to this Partnership Guidance Bureau, <laughs> who were very good, I must say, you know, after doing the uh, psychiatric tests and all that sort of thing. And the chap there said, well, what I suggest is that you take the sofa alternately. One of you, he said, Mr Muir, you have it for six months, he said, and then you, Mrs. Muir, Dennis Norton, Dennis Norton, he said, you have it for the next six months, which is what we decided. So he took it off to his new office on the North Circular Road for six months, and at the end of six months, I came and took it back to my office in Regent Street. Six months later, he came. Now, you may say, didn't that cost a lot of money in removal vans? The answer was, yes, it did. <laughs> until Frank, who behind all the emotionalism is, is very practical, um, said, well, it's very much easy. He said, we both have cars if we towed it <laughs> to and fro every season. Well, which we <clears throat> did, but you see, an, it's very difficult to tow an L-shaped <laughs> object because you get what I think is technically known as the jackknife effect. <laughs> Generally, right in the middle of the Harrow Road. <laughs> Then Frank came up with this very good idea, which is two <coughs> little cast iron rings, which we screwed in to the end of the arms, the L arms of the sofa, and thus could tow it behind the car with the back of the sofa in a wedge shape behind. If you do understand, I do hope you're following me because I'm not very good on this kind of thing. Uh, which we did, and the, but the point is, once you get them in your office, you then have to take the rings out. Otherwise, people come in and sit down, and they say, what are these rings on your sofa for, you know? And you say, they're for towing. <laughs> <laughs> and they, then they try to put their toe in it, you know? And, but, so we take them... So what the ceremony is, is you take... The chap who has it takes them out, and then when the time comes for the transfer, he gives the rings to the other partner or ex-partner for towing back again. And that's the explanation of that very simple little ceremony which may have puzzled some of you. Now, you may think that it's um, a very silly thing for two adults to do, but that is one of the things that you get at the end of any long relationship. You get this residue of rather bizarre triviality. <laughs> or if I may put it rather better, or as Thomas Gray put it, to each his sofa rings. <laughs> <laughs> And now on to Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, count your blessings one by one. Hugo the Wise Bunny Rabbit. <laughs> A Tale of Animal Land by Frank Muir. 
aged 48 and a half. <laughs> Bunny rabbits are wise and contented animals, and of all the rabbits, the wisest and contentedness was Hugo the bunny rabbit. Now Hugo lived and worked in the center of animal land and Hugo kept a club for the bunnies. <laughs> and Hugo called his club the Playthings Club. And when all the little animals went to the Playthings Club, they were greeted by a plaything who, and the little girl, the little girl plaything, was dressed up like a human being girl. <laughs> and they had a roulette wheel, and lots of gambling went on. <gasps> oh, yes. And lots of water voles used to go there, and which was very bad because, as you know, a vole and his money are soon passing. <laughs> And on the third floor, they had a cabaret. And sometimes it was usually something like a, a, a razor bill duck would do a strop tease or something like that. <laughs> and, and Hugo, the bunny rabbit, our wisest and uh, most contented <laughs> of all bunny rabbits, he, when the night was over, he used to go round all the four warrens, the east one and the south one and the north one and the west one, and count that all the little bunnies were safely in bed because he cared for them. They were entrusted in his care. He used to count uh, in the east one, 24, <coughs> divide by 2, that's 12, and the east one, there, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 10, divide by 2, that's 5, all present. You see, because when bunnies sleep, when little bunny girls sleep, they sleep all curled up and you can't tell one from the other, you have to count their ears and divide by two. <laughs> <coughs> well, one night, they had... It was a very special gala night at the Playthings Club. They had a very special cabaret. <laughs> and after, after it was all over, uh, Hugo went round and counted all the ears of his little Playthings, and the east one, one, two, three, four, five, all present. South one, all present. North one, all present. But west one... One little bunny missing. Hugo was consternated. He rushed outside. Something must have happened to this little girl in his charge. And the outside, he met an old friend of his, a funny old geezer. He, wasn't it a funny old geezer? He was a rather ancient water otter. But he, 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 said, he said to him, Have you... I've lost one of my little playthings. She's not asleep. Have you seen her? And the, the funny old geezer said, Ah, there's danger in the air. I sent it. I think she's been abducted. So they called the birds on the air and said, Is there an interloper? Because all fairy things are afraid of the robber, the farrier robbers, who come and, and trap them and snatch them and make fur coats out of them. Then they got a message, um, as Lark would have it, that, uh, that uh, a robber had been sighted on Hampster Heath. And he had a sack over his shoulder. So they crept up on him, and Hugo said to the old water otter, nip him in the ankle. So the water otter, because he's got strong teeth, and the water otter nipped him in the ankle, and the robber, the fire robber, dropped his sack and ran away howling through the night. And they opened the sack, and there was a very frightened little plaything bunny. She escaped scut-free. <laughs> and as they, and as, as they were walking back, escorting little bunny back, the, the, the old water otter, the funny old geezer, said to Hugo, you know, you are the happiest and the contentedest of, of all the bunnies, and it's because you look after the little things in your care so much, don't you? And Hugo said, I always made myself a rule, always before I go to sleep, count your playthings one by one. <laughs> Well, 
By your vote, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the two stories is won by Frank Muir, but nevertheless, the entire contest is won by Dennis Norton and Anne Scott James, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The programme was devised by Tony Shryan and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC. BBC presents My Word. And here to introduce the programme and the panel is Jack Longland. My Word is a word game played by people whose business is words. Those taking part are Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, Dillis Powell and Dennis Norton. Round one tries to test their vocabularies. Two marks if they get the meaning of these words roughly right. We begin with Anne Scott James. Anne, what is a hyetometer? H Y E T O M E T E R, hyetometer. That's a nasty one. Terrible isn't it? one, that. Something to do with moisture. Yes, isn't it? quite right. Um, um, a moisture measurer. That's it, but <laughs> it hasn't got a simpler name. Breathalyzer. <laughs> <laughs> A rain gauge. Absolutely right. Well done. <laughs> well done, Anne. Uh, two marks. Hyatometer is a rain gauge because the Greek word huitos means rain. And this means measuring the rain. Frank Muir, what is a, a ducker? D-U-C-K-E-R. Ducker. Is, is, it, is it as simple as, as somebody who ducks? It is, can be that, yeah. Is it a, um, a dope chick? Yes, absolutely right, well done. It disappears under water. Jolly good, well done, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> a ducker, uh, various kinds of diving bird, including particularly the dab chick or the water oozle, it can be a chap who just breeds ducks. <laughs> but that's different. Two marks. Dillis Powell, what is Modena? M-O-D-E-N-A, and I wouldn't normally pronounce it that way, but this is I how... it was a place. Yes, but quite apart from being a place, it's something else. Is it? Hmm. Who fished the murex up? Who Any fished the murex up? <laughs> yes. Who fished these off oh, in the world? It's a colour. That's what I'm trying it's to help you know. It's a yes. colour. It's a kind of purple. <laughs> a Modena Sorry. is deep purple, and it's named after the Italian city of Modena, where apparently this colour was first developed. Now, Dennis Norton, what's the meaning of antiprandial? A N T E P R A N D I A L, antiprandial. Um, I don't know whether it was you. I remember having an argument about this. I said that prandial meant lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody denied it. Yes. <laughs> antiprandial would be somebody who's against lunch, would be a. <laughs> Breakfast food manufacturer. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's why I said E and not Buffet R. Carrot. Oh, anti. Oh, yeah. I see, yes. It's sort of cocktail's name. It's a before lunch. That's it. Well, Something you can eat between meals. Are you absolutely <laughs> wedded to lunch? I am, actually. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, yes. I tend to be dogmatic. <laughs> yeah, I'll give you one and a half marks. But it is, in fact, before dinner. And, of course, it depends when you have your dinner. I have yes, my dinner at lunch. lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Antiprandial, before dinner, as opposed to postprandial, which are the sort of orgies you have after dinner. Well, before we begin round two, I give each team a quotation for them to write down. And I want the two women members of the two teams to study those quotations, because at the end, I shall ask them where the quotations come from. 
Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton, here's your quotation. A watched pot never boils. And Dennis Powell and Frank, yours is the pen is mightier than the sword. And at the end of the programme, I shall ask Dennis and Frank to give me their ideas of how these came to be said or written. Round two is a round of odds and ends. Two marks for correct answers. Anne Scott James, a famous work by an equally famous personality is known by a very much abbreviated version of its title. And the abbreviated version is The Origin of Species. Can you give me the full title? Oh, no. It's by Darwin. We can get that. Far. Yes, got that far. Yeah. Can I abbreviate it a bit? It's on the origin of species. Quite right. Up the origin of species. <laughs> <laughs> on the origin of species, species of the development of man from the um, ape. Oh. Yep. Uh, Charles Darwin wrote it on the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favoured races in the struggle for life. And he published it in 1859. It's caused nothing but trouble ever since. Frank Muir, define and say what is the difference between a hanging post and a banging post. A hanging post is either a uh, scaffold no. or it's an architectural term it, for yet. prop. Yes, you're getting nearer it. Like a clothesline. Um. <laughs> <laughs> that's a nice idea. Because <laughs> hanging things usually aren't hanging at all architecturally. No, that's very difficult indeed. I quite agree. But the, um, They're the uh, hypotenuse yes. of a rectangle of which the upright is the cathedral wall. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> one mark for effort. Think of something that swings to and fro before it shuts. A door. <laughs> oh, yes. It's the... Um, the left hand, or depending which way you're standing, the right hand side <laughs> of the door jam. Yes, but why? Why hanging and why banging? Ah, because it's the, um, it's the size of the pintles. Uh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the hinges are, are yes. fixed to the jam. Yes, yeah. And the other side? Banging? Bang. <laughs> <laughs> banging means either... A bang is either the, a noise or the action. Yes. Which both. produces the noise, or it means a... A straight haircut in front. <laughs> it does or that. back. <laughs> it does that too. I think one out of two again. Um, they're both gate posts. The hanging post is the post on which the gate is hung, and the banging post is the one against which it bangs when it's shut. Quite simple. Oh. One out of two. <laughs> now to this bar. <laughs> um, people are accustomed to the romantic expression about sailors or sailing ships that they have sailed the seven seas. What are the seven seas? Atlantic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One. Uh, Pacific. Pacific. Indian Ocean. Yes, that's yeah, three. Good. Three. Arctic Ocean. Yeah. Four. Um, Try the other end. Antarctic Ocean. That gives you five. You've only got five. You've got to do a bit of division. Bit of division. Oh, yet. North Atlantic. Yes. South Atlantic. Yes, and? North Pacific. Yes. South. Jolly good. <laughs> home and dry, or home and wet. Um, <laughs> two, I think, of yet. Dennis Norton, what is an Amazonian chin? <laughs> an Amazonian chin. They only chin. had one breast. The Amazon. That's right, that doesn't help. Yes, it does. They only half a chin. No, no. They were tough eggs. It was a thrusting. Yes, chin. but they weren't as tough as all that. I mean, if you met an Amazon and you looked at her chin. Well, if you, you wouldn't, would she you, really? <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's a beautiful chin. It it's much simpler. She's just not a beardy weirdy. What did you say? Not Oh, she's a lady. I mean, un unbearded chin. That's it. That's it. What's that? <laughs> Going that all way. round the house. <laughs> um, a beardless chin, as a woman warrior normally, I think, would have, and it comes in Shakespeare's Coriolanus, when with his Amazonian chin he drove the bristled lips before it. It meant he was a rather young chap and he hadn't got any beard either. Well, now we have a rather complicated round of origins and derivations, and three marks this time. If members of the team can first of all give me the present meaning and then the origin or derivation of these <laughs> words or expressions. Anne Scott James, to go off at half cock. Well, it means to start an operation and uh, in a half baked way. Yeah. And it comes from. Well, it's of course a printing term. 
No. Oh, come on. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, yes, Jack. No, no. Hyphenated words. No, if no. you leave out the second half after the hyphen, then that's half cock. I'm not going to give you half cock up. All right, but it was something to do with a gun. Something to do that's with much a, more like with, it. Um, the trigger. Oh. <laughs> you don't pull the trigger back properly, so you don't get yeah. a full explosion. That's like that theory that if you, the harder you pull the trigger, the further the bullet. Goes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think two and a half out of three. I think you've done pretty well. Um, a flash in the pan. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the other thing. Yes, a golf at half cock means some plan that misfires fairly literally because it's begun or started before it's really ready. And the old muzzle loaders, you, the firing pin um, struck a flint and caused a spark to explode the powder. And if the lever was only half cocked, that is, not drawn fully back, all you got was a slight sort of fire and no proper explosion and the bullet didn't go out. Or if you take a revolver, an old-fashioned revolver, it has two positions. There's a catch halfway back, which is a half-cocked position, or you put it right back, and then if you fire, it fires properly. Frank Muir... Eden. It's a demi paradise. <laughs> it's a scepted isle. It could be all of that. What in origin did the word Eden mean? This is the more difficult one. The paradisical. <laughs> yes. Uh, but don't look so surprised. Well, I think two and a half. Eden is nowadays used as paradise in the Garden of Eden, a place of supreme delight, first abode of man, all the rest of it. But the word Eden didn't mean this at all, written. It just meant pleasure, or it meant delight, and therefore it's correct to say the Garden of Eden, that is the Garden of Delight, the Garden of Pleasure. And uh, only later did the word Eden itself come to mean a place. So two and a half. Tell us power. Woe begone, W O E, and then begone. Woe begone. <coughs> Woe begone means looking rather miserable. Mm -hmm. Why? Is it um, talking to a horse? <laughs> <laughs> well, I if you say woe, <laughs> the back end stops, and if you say begone, the front end goes away. <laughs> Catastrophe results. <laughs> I, know some, I know some pretty gloomy horses, but this has never happened to me yet. <laughs> Where begun? Where's begun? One and a half. Um, where begone means dismal, unhappy, beset with woe, but the begone part of it is a corruption of an old word, an old English word, begun, which means surrounded by. So that where begone really means surrounded by sorrow. Now, Dennis Norden, gin. Well, the, the meaning is, is, is that stuff that Cheers up tonic water. <laughs> um, the origin. I can give you the result <laughs> more easily than the origin. I think I think something to do with the fact that gin is made from juniper yep, fairies. Yep. I think you get your three marks. Um, gin uh, originally was called Geneva, uh, which was the name given by Dutch and Germans to this particular spirit distilled from either grain or malt and flavoured with juniper juice, so not always. And the Dutch name for juniper was Geneva, and the French used to be Genevre, and it's now Genievre. And it became known in the other side of the uh, water as Hollands. But the point here, when and Dennis didn't allow himself to be trapped, uh, is it has nothing whatever to do with the Swiss city Geneva. Well, now we come to the last round, and go back to those two quotations I gave the teams earlier in the programme. Two marks, and Scott James. Can you give me the origin of your quotation? A watched pot never boils. Well, I think it's a proverb, Jack. I think it almost certainly was. It is, has been used by various chaps at various times with names. Well, it was first used anonymously in the 13th century. <laughs> it was then occurs in Gamma, Girton's Needle, and subsequently in Bowman and Fletcher. <laughs> <laughs> I can't give the page numbers immediately. <laughs> uh, but you can get it on application. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> But a proverb. I'm pretty think. sure it started as a proverb, and I'll give you your two marks. But it does come in The Spectator in 1908, which is rather surprising. Oh, it, it comes rather specially in a novel by Mrs. Gaskell called Mary Barton, which she wrote in 1848. But it must have been a proverb originally. Now, Dillis Powell, I like the origin of your quotation. A pen is mightier than the sword. I think it came in a Victorian novel. It did? You're quite right. Do you remember which one? Bulwer Lytton. Well done. It's only good. <laughs> 
Um, two marks it is. This is Bulwer Lytton, or Lord Lytton, talking about Cardinal Richelieu, and the phrase is something like this, if the head of the state is a truly just man, the pen is mightier than the sword. Two marks. Well, now I'm going to ask Dennis and Frank to give me their explanations of how these quotations came into being, and for this round, the marks will go to whichever incredible explanation receives the longer applause from the audience here in the theatre. So, back to Dennis Norden and his quotation, a watched pot never boils. Well, some eight months ago, I received, um, after one of these programmes, a very unusual letter from somebody who'd listened to it. It said, Dear Mr Norden, um, I am a psychiatrist, and after listening to several of the stories that you tell at the end of my word, I have come to the conclusion that you need help. <laughs> <clears throat> Would you please call upon me as soon as possible? And finally I went to see him. He had a very impressive sort of office, very stark, with one of these the kind of the new fashion of an empty desk, except for just two trays, one of which was marked outgoing, the other was marked introverted. <laughs> and what he had to say shook me. He said, Mr. Norden, he said, I think that you have def a definite neurotic fixation, judging on the evidence of the stories you've recently been telling. He said, take, for instance, the story you told last week. Now, what was that one? I said, well, it was about this schoolboy who got his head stuck through a hole in a Henry Moore statue. <laughs> And he said, exactly. He said, and uh, what was the story you told the week before? And I said, well, that was about Frank Muir, how he got his finger stuck in an electric pencil sharpener. <laughs> I said, yes. And he said, what about the week before that? And I said, well, that was, that was about what happened to my uncle when he was having a bath. And he said, well, what did happen? I said, well, he got his big toe stuck in the plug hole. <laughs> He said to me, Mr. Norden, do not observe a common theme <laughs> that seems to run through these stories. I said, well, I tell them because I think they're funny. He said to you, he said, you may think you think they're funny, but I can tell you that you only think that you think that you think they're funny. He said, because these things do not happen in real life to that enormous extent. He said, what it indicates in you, he said, is you are mythologizing physically on some psychological inadequacy in yourself. <laughs> I was beginning to feel terrible. <laughs> and I said, well, well, can you do something for me? I mean, can you help me? I mean, is there some kind of ointment? <laughs> and he said, no. This is not a problem that can be solved that way. He said, it means delving, Mr. Norton, delving into your mind, your subconscious. I said, yes, all right, you know. So we delved. <laughs> but he finally found it. It was a, what they call a childhood trauma. When I was 12 and a half, my mother had sewn my sister's name tapes onto my football socks. <laughs> It had given me what he called a crisis of identity. <laughs> and it was this, you see, that had caused it. You see, he was terribly bucked when he found it out. You see, he said, that's it. He said, that's your problem. He said, you've been displacing it onto your story. He said, you are now a whole man. He said, you are, save for the mere 20 guineas signing off fee, cured. <laughs> well, I was terribly pleased as well, you see. And, and, I wouldn't have to tell this kind of sick story anymore. And I sat to try and think of one. And I couldn't think of anything. I realised by taking this particular neurosis away from me, he had emptied me dry. And I rang up in a terrible panic to ask him to help me. But he wasn't there. And his nurse answered. She said, I'm terribly sorry, but the doctor was taken to hospital yesterday. Oh, I said, I'm, I'm sorry to... Was it anything serious? And she said, well... 
And I thought she sounded a bit embarrassed. <clears throat> and she said, <clears throat> you see, we had the loo painted. <clears throat> and he forgot that the varnish on it was still tacky. <laughs> and when he tried to get up, it stuck. And he went off in the ambulance with it still affixed. <laughs> they took him face downwards. <laughs> and then I realized that after all, he had helped me. Because while stories about trapped fingers and imprisoned heads and stuck big toes may be chancy, however, in the words of the old proverb, a wedged butt never fails. <laughs> well, I'm awfully glad I'm not a whole man. Mm. Um, and we move on to uh, Frank Muir, and if you remember, his quotation was, the pen is mightier than the sword. <clears throat> For the last few months, people have been asking my wife, people who've watched me walking around Thorpe at home or Wembley where I work, they said, um, why is your husband so behave rather oddly? He always has his nose stuck in a book. I'm trying to alter the shape of my nose, you see. <laughs> I find that if you clamp a, a book on your nose and keep it there all day, eventually, given a year or two, it'll gradually slim down the nostrils. And the last book I had the nut clamped on my nose was called Worthies of Old Windsor. And the first worthy was, was terribly interesting. It was a chap called Dr. Erasmus Arbuthnot. And it turned out that this chap, Dr. Arbuthnot, you know that Windsor is famous for three things. It's famous for the castle, for Brown Windsor soup, and for Brown Windsor soap. And Dr. Arbuthnot, and in fact, in invented two of these, <laughs> the latter two. The most interesting chap, actually, he'd, uh, he'd invented a, a stethoscope with a warm end. <laughs> and uh, he, invented, well, he invented a double bed pan for double beds. But, uh, <laughs> he, Nothing came of these, of these inventions until uh, he met with an unfortunate accident. He was on the, uh, the new railway line which connected Aldershot to Waterloo. It was a cutting, actually. And he was down in the cutting trying to determine why a train whistle goes whoo and it's passed. Why the noise of the train always descends. And unfortunately, he was in the cutting and a train arrived and he ran in front of it and, and failed um, to um, avoid it and was, uh, lost both his legs. Afterwards, at the hospital, they asked him why he didn't climb up the embankment. But with, with this ruthless scientific logic, he said that if I couldn't beat it on the flat, what chance would I have had uphill? <laughs> He was then fitted with two wooden legs and he carried on his practice until uh, the fateful evening at a fireworks display <laughs> and was burnt to the ground. <laughs> but among his, among his posthumous papers, uh, they did find this, uh, this formula which said brown wins a soup and it had lentils and dried beans and marrow fat and... Uh, uh, a touch of cinnamon, and the trouble was they couldn't, it said recipe for Brown Windsor soup, but being a doctor, of course, his writing was frightfully bad, and the scientists of the day couldn't determine whether he'd invented Brown Windsor soup or Brown Windsor soap. <laughs> so they decided to make the formula up in two forms, <laughs> liquid and solid, <laughs> which is why, to this day, Brown Windsor soap looks like soup, and Brown Windsor soup tastes like soap. So if you invent anything, uh, do take the lesson we can learn from the history of Dr. Arbuthnot and go for the stomach rather than cleanliness. <laughs> <laughs>
The public is obviously far more interested in, the, um, in eating uh, the juice of lentils than in proliferating uh, lava. In other words, as uh, Lord Bulwer-Lytton said, the bean is mightier than the sud. <laughs> your vote, ladies and gentlemen, the contest of the stories is won by Frank Muir, and yet nevertheless, Anne Scott James and Dennis Norton win the entire contest, and that brings to an end this edition of My Word. In My Word, you heard Dillis Powell, Anne Scott James, Frank Muir, and Dennis Norton, introduced by Jack Longland. The program was devised by Tony Schreien and Edward J. Mason and presented by the BBC.